are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Taking my cross, my sin, my shame. Rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. She maketh fine linen, and selleth it, and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. 
Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up, and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruits of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. With today being Mother's Day and in honor of all the mothers who are here this morning, I am not just merely speaking to the mothers in this room nearly as much as I am to every man, woman, boy, and girl who is here today. No one knows the life of a mother any better than a mother herself. No one knows the joy of a mother any better than a mother. No one knows the sadness or the tears or the pain that a mother faces daily in her life any better than a mother herself. So this morning I want to relay a message of encouragement to all the mothers and to teach our husbands and our children and our grandchildren about the real beauty and compassion that is found in a mother. I'm preaching to you a message this morning, and I am calling this title, A Woman of True Beauty. Would you lift your hands toward heaven right now? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. And Lord, we thank you for every mother that is gathered here in this church this morning. And God, I pray that there will be unity in every family. Let every heart be filled with the love of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray that your word will speak to us. And Lord, as we come together around this altar, let there be love, let there be unity, let there be a desire to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray that you will mold us and shape us every day of our life. And we praise your name forever. Amen. Somebody once said that it takes six weeks to get back to normal. After you have had a baby, that somebody does not know that once you become a mother, normal is history. Somebody said that you learn how to be a mother by instinct. Somebody never took a two-year-old shopping. Somebody said being a mother is boring. Somebody has never ridden in a car driven by their teenager who has just received their learner's permit. Somebody said good mothers never raised their voices. Somebody never went out the back door just in time to see their child hit a baseball through the neighbor's kitchen window. Somebody said, if you're a good mother, then your child will turn out good. Somebody thinks that children come with an owner's manual and a money-back guarantee. Somebody said, you don't need an education to be a mother. Somebody never helped their child with their homework. Somebody said you can't love the fifth child as much as you love the first. Somebody doesn't have more than one child. Somebody said the hardest part of being a mother is labor and delivery. Somebody never watched her baby get on the school bus for the first day of school or leave home for their first day of college. Somebody said a mother can stop worrying after her child gets married. Somebody does not realize that a marriage adds a new son or daughter-in-law to a mother's heartstrings. Somebody once said that a mother's job is done when her last child leaves home. Somebody never had grandchildren. Somebody said your mother knows that you love her, so why bother to tell her? That somebody is not a mother. I want to focus this morning on three particular scriptures. Proverbs chapter 21, or Proverbs chapter 31 Verse 28 through 31, I'm going to read it again. It says, Her children arise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. So many times, women in this world feel overwhelmed instead of encouraged. The ideal woman was described in Proverbs chapter 31 over 2,500 years ago, and she has been intimidating mothers 
ever since that time. Who can possibly live up to the ideal woman that is described in Proverbs chapter 31? When we are growing up, we all have our expectations. We all have our standards of what we hope for in life, of what we hope for in the perfect spouse. And, and although what we always dream for is never what we get, but what we get many times is often better than what we dreamt for. I told my wife just yesterday, I always dreamt of what the perfect wife would be like. But then I looked at her and I said, but you have excelled in every way. I never knew when I was growing up who my wife was going to be. But I'm so thankful that she is who she is. I want us to look at something very important from the start. Look again at verse number 30. It says, favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord shall be praised. In the New Living Translation, it says it like this. Charm is deceptive and beauty does not last. But a woman who fears the Lord will be greatly praised. Think about that for just a moment. Charm deceives. Beauty fades. It does not last. But a woman who fears the Lord. In other words, a woman who respects the love of God. A woman who stands upon the word of truth. An individual, not just a woman, but any individual. Man, woman, boy, and girl. If we stand on the word of God, we yield to the truth of God's word. That means that we are a person worthy of praise. That means they're going to earn respect. They're going to be admired. Now this contrasts to the things of this world. I'm not preaching against makeup and jewelry. There's some people in this world that I think need a little bit to make them look good. But makeup and jewelry does not have the final say-so in what makes a person beautiful. But it's, it's the portrait of a person. If, if, if a person wants to see what real beauty is. See, so many times, more often than not, people want to honor the beauty queen. But if we want to see a portrait of a woman who is truly beautiful, her beauty is not based upon how much makeup she wears. Her beauty is not based upon how expensive her clothing is or how excessive her jewelry is. But the Bible is clear that a woman who fears the Lord will be greatly praised. And not only for the women, but the same can be said as the men. The children as well. We sometimes idolize the tough, athletic tough guy image, but our physical strength and might is not impressive to God. In fact, the Word of God tells us in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7 through 9, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother, for they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head, and chains about thy neck. These words were, in, were written as instructions from the wisest man of all time, King Solomon, to his son, Lemuel. The book of Proverbs ends with the sayings of King Lemuel. And, and Solomon was instructing his son to gain wisdom and knowledge through the fear of the Lord. And so Lemuel pictures the life lived under the fear of the Lord through a godly woman, a wife of notable character. Now it's interesting to note that the book of Proverbs opens with instructions from Solomon for his son, but then it ends in chapter 31 with instructions for a woman. However, this is not really the thing. It's an instruction for every individual in this world. It's, it's how the Holy Ghost has put the writings together in the book of Proverbs to show us how to live our life through the fear of God. Mm -hmm. To live our life according to His Word. The Bible tells us in John chapter 8, verse 31 through 32, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on Him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. Well, that erases every idea of, of a once saved, always saved mentality. There's people that I have went to school with, they tell me they went to church as a little kid, they went to the altar, they repeated a prayer, and it makes no difference what they do in their life, they're saved, they're on their way to heaven. That's a lie from hell. Listen to me. Jesus clearly said, if you continue in my word. Not just start, continue. He said, if you continue in my word, 
Then are you my disciples indeed. And he says it's the truth. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Verse 36 says, If the Son therefore shall make you free, then ye shall be free indeed. It's very clear to read that if, if we want to be someone who's recognized by God, if we want to live a life of holiness, if we want to live a life of righteousness, we must live in the fear of God. That means being obedient to what He says. Live according to His Word. Live according to His standards. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12 through 13, it says, Fear the Lord thy God. Walk in all His ways and love Him. And serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and the statutes which I command thee this day for thy good. See, this is the message for every individual in this room this morning. Let me speak to the, the mothers and the, and the ladies in this sanctuary for just a moment. Wives, don't let your husbands hold Proverbs chapter 31 over your head like a ball in shame. This is not a to-do list. Proverbs is not telling every wife that all you have to do is, from sun up to sundown every day is to cook and to clean and to wash clothes and, and to do all kinds of chores around the house. It's, it's not what he's talking about. But the responsibility of the husband is to love his wife. Because when the husband and the wife became married as one, they made a pledge to each other. They made a solemn oath before the Lord to love and to cherish and honor in sickness and health for rich, for poor, for better, for worse, as long as you both shall live. And to the mothers in this sanctuary this morning and for everyone that's here today, I want to tell you that be a real person who fears the Lord. Be someone who acknowledges the truth of God's Word, who walks with Him, who talks with Him, who seeks the face of God daily in your life. And we can learn from these principles that's listed in Proverbs chapter 31 as a, an example of living a real life in a real world filled with real problems. Trouble's going to come. You can guarantee it. Sickness is going to come. There's going to be things that happen in life that we have no power to stop it. It's just going to happen. It's the what I call daily life. Life is like the ocean tide. You never know what it's going to bring in. We have no control of what's going to take place. But everyone dreams of, of an ideal world. You see, in the ideal world, everything is perfect. Nothing ever goes wrong. In the ideal world, everyone gets what they ask for and when they want it. See, work is easy. The payoff is immediate in the ideal world. In the ideal world, life is like a fairy tale with a happy fairy tale ending, reading, and they lived happily ever after. But in the real world, it's a different story. In the real world, problems are the normal experience of everyday life. In the real world, life is not fair and dreams are broken. In the real world, work makes you sweat and it makes you, uh, sometimes the rewards are not received when you would like them to be. In fairy tales, the story ends by saying, and they lived happily ever after. But in the real world, the story goes on to say, and they survived to live yet another day. When in reality, our story should say, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and of the word of their testimony. You see, what should it say about us who, who live our lives according to the fear of the Lord? What will a person be like when they live in the fear of God? What will mothers be like when they have a total desire in their life to please the Lord and to surrender to Him? What would it be like if every father surrendered his will to the Lord and to be the godly man that God has called him to be? What if every married couple submitted their life, submitted their marriage, and, and placed their marriage upon the Lord Jesus Christ? What if, would it be like if every child, every teenager submitted their will to the Lord? You see, when we fear the Lord our God, that's going to make us an individual who is trustworthy. Proverbs chapter 31, verse 11 through 12 in the New Living, it says, Her husband can trust her, and she will greatly enrich his life. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. Did you know that it takes a lifetime to build a reputation? But that reputation can be destroyed in a moment's time. 
You see, for a person to be trustworthy, they must demonstrate over a long period of time that they can be trusted, that they can be dependent upon. And those who are trustworthy are dependable. They are reliable and they're steadfast. They're honest and they're truthful and upright. See, every one of us is going to stand before God on judgment day. Romans chapter 14 verse 12 says that every one of us will give an account of our life to God. When you fear the Lord, you are careful to remember that we will stand before God. That we will have to give an account of our life to Him. And, and when we do so, we want to hear God say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. In other words, we want God to look at our life and say, Yes, you were someone that I could trust. You were someone that I could depend upon. You were someone who was loyal to me. And yes, He could say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. See, to be trustworthy is to be like Jesus. We can be certain that when we are like Him, See, we used to sing a song in church, to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus. All I ask is to be like Him. All through life's journey from earth to glory, all I ask is to be like Jesus. How was Jesus? He lived a sinless life. He lived a life. He, he said no to the things of this world. He said no to temptation. We can do the same. We can do the same. See, those who fear the Lord are diligent. They're hardworking. Proverbs 31, verse 13 and 15. In the New Living it says, She finds wool and flax and busily spins it. She is like a merchant's ship, bringing her food from afar. She gets up before dawn to prepare breakfast for her household and plan the day's work for her servant girls. In verse 27 it says, She carefully watches everything in her household and suffers nothing from laziness. See, contrary to what a lot of people in this world believe, work is not a result of the curse. Did you know work existed before sin did? When God created this world, He created the Garden of Eden, guess what He did? He put Adam and Eve in the midst of that garden so they could cultivate it. And when God created the animals, He brought the animals to Adam so that He could name them what He wanted to call them. Work existed. God wanted mankind to work because it's through the cultivation and through the tilling that He was going to be able to eat. But it's because of the curse of sin, the work has been cursed. After the curse of sin, not only was mankind going to have to till the ground, but the ground was going to be cursed with thorns and thistles. And the Lord told Adam that you're going to earn your food by the sweat of your brow. See, the Bible tells us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Psalms chapter 128, verse 2 says, For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. Those who fear the Lord are future-minded. In Proverbs chapter 31, verse 16, she goes to inspect a field and buys it with her earnings. She plants a vineyard. She is energetic and strong and is a hard worker. She makes sure her dealings are profitable. Her lamp burns late into the night. Her hands are busy spinning thread. Her fingers twisting fiber. Did you know that there were three days that shape our life, all the days of our life? Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Many people let the cares of yesterday shape their life. They're worried about the things that they've done and their, their, their life is filled with if only, if only I had done this. If only I had done that. If only I had not said those things to that individual. If only I had not bought this. If only I had not given this away. If only I had not hurt my friend. If only I had not said this to my family member. They're worried about the things of yesterday. And there's nothing they can do about it. All that we can do is give it to Jesus. And Jesus is the only one who can erase the problems of yesterday. Yes, the scar is going to be there. But He can forgive us. He can take away the pain. He can take away the hurt and the shame. We give it to Him. And then we're worried about what's going to take place tomorrow. We have all these plans and we say, you know, this is what I want to do tomorrow. I have this big to-do list of A through Z and, and then A, A through Z, Z and everything that I want to do. And, and this is what I'm going to do tomorrow. We have no promise of what's going to take place. We have no promise what's going to take place tonight. 
Yes, we have a plan for tonight's service. We have a list of songs that we're going to do. But we cannot guarantee that it will take place. Jesus could come before we have an opportunity to come back. There could be a natural disaster, a tornado come through, wipe this place off the map, and we wouldn't be here. We have no promise. We do have one guarantee, and that is today. Did you know that today is a gift from God? It's a gift from God. Maybe that's why they call it the present. I don't know. But we are here today for one purpose. We have this moment to trust in Him, to surrender our will to Him, and to serve Him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our minds. Amen. This is what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 through 34. He said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take the thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is evil thereof. In Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21, the Bible says, There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord that shall stand. In James chapter 4, verse 13 through 15, Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow, we will go to such a city. And continue there a year, and buy, and sell, and get gain. For as ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live, and do this or that. I'm going to hang out right there at that verse for just a minute. If you was to walk up the street just a few blocks Across the street from where the Bill Watkins house is all of his neighbors that live there that never give him any trouble. And all across that field, you see all these headstones. You see the names. And you see the, the, the year they were born. And you see the year that they passed away. But that's not the important part. It's that little dash in between those years. That's what makes the difference. So what you need to think about is this. One day soon, every one of us in this room, we're all going to be gone. And people are going to pass by our stone. They're going to see the dates that we live from beginning to the end. But that's not what they're going to focus on. They're going to remember what happened in between the beginning and the end. They're going to remember when you gave. They're going to remember when you took. They're going to remember the good. And they're going to remember the bad. And whatever you do with life, we must do to glorify Jesus Christ. Amen. Because He is the only one that we have to look forward to. We can't put our hope in the things of this world. We can't put our hope in this government. It's all going to fail away. It's all going to crumble. But we can trust in Jesus Christ. We have no promise of tomorrow. Ira Stanfield had it right in his song. He said, many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand. I don't know who holds tomorrow, but I know who holds my hand. See, when we trust in the Lord, we're going to be generous. In Proverbs chapter 31, verse 20, the Bible says that she extends a helping hand to the poor and opens her arms to the needy. See, everything that we have belongs to God. Job understood. He said they were his to give, they were his to take away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 through 19, it says, Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. That they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. When we fear the Lord our God, that means we're going to be a person who speaks with wisdom, who speaks with respect. You know, respect is something that we don't see much of anymore. Used to, you would see a, a little boy or little girl walking maybe in the church or out in the street somewhere, and you would ask them, how are you? And they would say, I'm doing fine, sir. How are you? Nowadays, you ask someone how they're doing, they just laugh at your face, they'll keep on going. I'm not saying it happens to people here. I, I love the children of this church. Don't misunderstand me. But I'm saying things have changed. It's not like it used to be anymore. And so when we fear the Lord, 
We're going to teach others to fear the Lord. We're going to teach them respect. We're going to teach them wisdom. In Proverbs 31, verse 23, her husband is well known at the city gates where he sits with other civic leaders. She makes belted linen garments and sashes to sell to the merchants. She is clothed with strength and dignity, and she laughs without fear of the future. When she speaks, her words are wise, and she gives instructions with kindness. You see, the, the fear of the Lord teaches us not to be careless with our speech, not to be careless with the things that we do. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, verse 36, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. In Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. And finally, when a person fears the Lord, when their life is living for God, they will be a person who develops an inner godly character. In Proverbs 31, verse 28, it says, Her children stand and bless her. Her husband praises her. There are many virtuous and capable women in this world, but you surpass them all. See, if you remember earlier in that chapter, he's talking about all the different activities, all the functions, all the duties that a woman does in her life. But then he sums it all up right here. He says, there are many virtuous and capable women in the world, but you surpass them all. Why? He says, charm is deceptive. Beauty does not last. But a woman who fears the Lord will be greatly praised. Reward her for all she has done. Let her deeds publicly declare her praise. Someone once said, you can fool all of the people some of the time. And some of the people all of the time. But you cannot fool mom. You know why? Moms know us. Moms know us from the day we're born until the day that she passes. She knows how we live our life. We can dress up. We can try to cover it up. But a mother knows her child's heart. A mother hurts when her child hurts. A mother rejoices when her child rejoices. A mother's heart is fashioned to her children's heart. Whatever her children face, I have a feeling that the mother faces it even worse because she's already worried about her children. She's already crying out to the Lord and asking God to form a hedge of protection. I remember growing up as a child, my dad and mother would always tell me that they plead the blood upon my life. In church, that's what we must do. Mothers, fathers, plead the blood of Jesus Christ upon your children. We're seeing things take place in this world today that we never dreamed of possible. School shootings almost every day. We have no... I'm so thankful how you have no idea how blessed your school district is to have the leadership that they have. To allow prayer to go on in the high school gymnasium at a school activity. It's something that's being done away with in this generation in which we're living today. Don't ever take for granted what you have in this community. I kid you not. Do not take it for granted. Don't take for granted the, the ability that we have to come together and worship here on a Sunday morning. Don't take for granted that you have an opportunity to go to a school where you can share the love of Jesus Christ when, when the valedictorian and the, the, the historian can stand up there publicly in front of hundreds of people and declare his relationship with Jesus Christ and encourage other people in that stadium at the high school that if they need guidance and direction in their life to look to the one who is the guide and director who is Jesus Christ. Don't ever take things like that for granted because there will come a time when it will be against the law to do what took place in this school district this week. See, don't just develop good character, but develop a godly inner character. What makes the difference in Christian character is that we're not answering to man. We're not answering to the president. We're not answering to the Supreme Court. 
But we're answering to Jesus Christ. Yeah. He is the one that we're going to stand before on Judgment Day. Yeah, this government can say what it wants to say. It can approve every kind of perversion that it wants to approve. But the Word of God is a higher authority. And we must take a stand for what is right. And if the Bible says it's right, then it's right. If the Bible says it's wrong, then it's wrong. There comes a time in our life where we must stand on something that is true. Something that is solid. We cannot stand upon what we feel. We cannot stand upon on what we desire, that we can stand on the Word of God, which is a solid foundation. Jesus said, Upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Amen. That's the truth. Jesus said, You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And who the Son sets free yeah. is free indeed. Amen. That's what we do. That's the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. See, in conclusion, I want to challenge every mother. I want to challenge every father. That when you are someone who fears the Lord, that means you are someone who is trustworthy. You can be trusted in every area of your life. If you are someone who fears the Lord, that means that you are diligent. You are hard working. You're doing what you can to provide for your family, to provide for your children. If you are a person who fears the Lord, that means your future mind. You're concerned about the day of judgment. You're concerned about, are my children living right? You're concerned about, are my children going to stand before Jesus and will they be able to hear Him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. When we fear the Lord, we're going to be generous. We're going to be giving. We're going to help others when we can. We're going to give to the needy. When we fear the Lord, we're going to speak with wisdom. We're going to speak with respect. We're going to speak the words of God. And when we are a person who fears the Lord, that means we are a person who develops inner character. Because we may be able to dress ourselves up on the outside. But church, it's what's on the inside that's most important. It's what's in your heart that's what matters the most. And so today, being Mother's Day, I want to challenge every mother. I want to challenge every father. In fact, I want to challenge every individual that's in this room. See, in just a moment, we're going to pray for our mothers. We're going to honor them. But in the midst of that time of prayer, we're going to have entire families come together for a time of family prayer. Because the family takes everyone. You can't have a family with just one person. You can't have a family with just a child. You can't have a family with just an individual. You have a family somewhere. A family that prays together is a family that stays together. It's not just for the mothers, but it's for the dads too. It's for the children. It's for the grandparents, the, the grandmas, the grandpas, and the grandkids. See, we need to let the fear of God and the love of Jesus Christ be the foundation that our family and that our church that our life is built upon because Jesus Christ is the solid rock. And if we build our life, if we build our family on that solid rock, you can say, let the winds flow, let the storms come, let hell rage, let this world come up against me. For I know in whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that nothing in this world is going to stop me. I'm going to go forward with power. I'm going to go forward with boldness. And if God be for me, who can be against me? Because I'm an overcomer by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony. Can we stand together across this sanctuary? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for every mother. For every father, for every family that's in this room today. And God, I just pray that you would bring unity into every family. For if there is unity in every family, there will be unity throughout this church. There will be unity throughout this community. And God, I pray that you will bless each one in Jesus' name. I would like to ask at this time for every mother in this auditorium, if you would come and stand across this front facing me. Spread out. Go from one side of the sanctuary to the other. Every mother. If you could come up here to the front. Church, we're fixing to do something. And I believe God's going to do something great in this church. Every mother. 
kind of spread out. Make sure we have plenty of room. Fill up here in the, the front. If y'all could, just come on. Scatter around. If we have to, we can go up the side aisles. This is a glorious sight to all of these mothers. This being Mother's Day. Mothers, I want to challenge you. Teach your kids the truth. Teach them the way of Jesus Christ. Teach them that there is no other way to salvation except through Jesus Christ. That He is the way. That He is the truth. And He is the life. Are you committed to serve Him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind? How about it, men? I want the husbands of every wife to come and stand with your wife right now. Every husband. If you have a wife that's up here, I want you to come and stand with your wife. <laughs> Children, grandchildren, how about it? Let's come up here and join your mother. Let's come up here and join with your grandmother. And I want the heads of the households. I want you to pray a prayer over your family. Say, I will choose to serve the Lord upon this rock. As me and my house, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We're going to refuse to give in to the things of this world. We're going to refuse to give in to the things of life that comes against the church. But we will stand for God. We will stand for the truth. Let's begin to praise Him right now in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank You, Jesus. And God, we pray in the name of Jesus that You will bless every family. God, that you would fill every family, Lord, with, with unity and love and grace and power through the anointing of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Lord, it's not by magic or by power, but it's by your Spirit, Jesus. God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we pray for strength. We pray for your anointing. We pray, Father, for the peace of God that passes all understanding in Jesus' name. God, in Jesus' name, Lord, I pray for Jesus, Lord. God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, Lord, Jesus, bring an anointing into her life, God, and into her family in Jesus' name. Hallelujah to your name. Lord, touch this to Carol today, God. Lord, to every good father to bring you to the Lord. Lord, to
the east and the west. Lord, more than anything, that they will come to know you as their Lord and Savior through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that in every family, Lord, that they will be a family of prayer, that their house will be built upon the rock, that when the storms of life come crashing their way, that it makes no difference what comes against them. It makes no difference what this world tries to do to them. They will not be stopped. They will not be moved. They will not be shaken. They will not be destroyed. Because greater is He that is in them than he that is in this world. Lord, no weapon formed against them will prosper. And Lord, we thank You, Jesus. And we pray for a hedge of protection. We plead the blood upon their lives, God, in Jesus' name. Lord, we're desperate for you, Jesus. And we cry out to you, Father, for your strength, for your ability, God, to do the work that you have called us to do, to be what you have called us to be. Lord, without you, we're nothing. But Lord, with you, we have hope. With you, we have strength. With you, we have life. With you, we have victory. Jesus name. And so Lord, today we praise you. We thank you for every mother. We thank you for every father, for every head of the household. And Lord, I pray that you will give wisdom to us, that you will guide us, that you will direct us and lead us, Father, in the path of righteousness for your name's sake. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And amen. Church, can you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? He is worthy of all of our praise. Yes, your name forever. He is worthy. Lord, we praise your name, Jesus. We praise your name, Lord, for all that you have done in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. He is worthy, church. Hallelujah. Don't forget to tell your mother, Happy Mother's Day, and that you love her. Don't forget prayer meeting tonight at 5 o'clock at the church at 6. God bless you.